Thrilled to have you. My name is John Farrar, uh, usual host here, and joining me, uh, one of our typical co-hosts, Alex Usner. Alex, so good to have you back. Welcome in. Hello. Uh, and this is going to be an exciting episode, uh, and I think maybe an atypical one for us, because we've got a really special guest and somebody who's probably been, I think, one of the pioneers at driving innovation and, and disruption uh, into this space. Um, we have Tori Patterson with us from Owl Ventures. And I, I would say there's nobody better at um, understanding where the education space is going from an entire global perspective, uh, really getting a beat on it, and again, kind of putting his money where his mouth is, at least as far as his venture firm uh, is concerned. Um, I think Tori is probably responsible for the term ed tech, maybe in some ways, uh, certainly was getting his arms around it before the rest of us were using it as, as common vernacular. So with that as an intro, I'd love to welcome Tori Patterson, uh, to the stage. Well, thanks so much for having me, John. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to connect with the audience here. Uh, Sorry, so I, have been, I have been waiting with bated breath. There's been so much innovation and investment going on in ed tech. I could not wait for this conversation. Thanks for coming. <laughs> but listen, Tori, like, I'm not going to assume that everybody uh, probably has the, the same history that we do with you. Uh, and we've gotten to know you over the last year, and it's been fascinating to learn the OWL uh, history, I guess, as well as your history, and then see where you've all taken this in the last 12 to 18 months as, as the tectonics of the entire space across the globe have changed. But can you give us a, a brief synopsis on uh, what you've been doing with your life before you got on this uh, the show with us today? <laughs> Absolutely. Appreciate that. Um, a little history on me. I, I, I grew up in California. Uh, I went to Williams College and then became an investment banker with a firm called Roberts and Stevens in San Francisco. Um, I then uh, was lucky enough to go to business school and, and switch gears a little bit and, and get into the venture capital business in 2007. Uh, I made my first ed tech investment in 2009 into a company called Presence Learning. Um, and, and since that that great day, I've, I've, all, I've only invested in education companies. Um, I had I had the, the good fortune of getting to launch Owl Ventures uh, with a great team in, in 2014, um, and since then we've we've scaled to you know about 1.3 billion in assets under management. We've uh, invested you know very aggressively in the ed tech space uh, since then uh, across five funds and. Um, yeah, and, and with the with the, I mean, I know we're going to get into this, but with the pandemic, uh, you know, really shifting everyone's attention towards this category, um, we've leaned in, you know, extremely hard, and uh, you know, we've been we've put about five hundred million dollars to work since last March, uh, and and that was a, a scary thing to do, but also, you know, the trends that we were seeing, you know, justified that, that aggressive approach. So, yeah, excited to get into it with you. <clears throat> So five hundred million dollars is a is a dizzying amount, and I think what's interesting about it is it really, at least from my knowledge of it, what I can understand, it's really been um, across the ecosystem. Uh, it seems like there are areas that you've you've gone harder in, but it's a pretty diversified set of investments that you've made across K twelve, higher learning, student services, and the like. I guess maybe just um, since you started there. Talk to us a little bit about how you're looking at the market, um, not just domestically, but also globally. I think the audience would probably be surprised to learn how much attention you've paid to um, the rest of the world, really. Yeah, yeah, happy to talk about that. So, you know, we view the market, uh, you know, in four big buckets, early learning, K-12, post-secondary, and then career and corporate upskilling, what we call career mobility. So we like to think about that that uh, professional learning category from the perspective of the individual, not necessarily the institution. Um, and, and so what I'd say is the, the vast majority uh, of our investment has gone into K-12 as well as that career mobility category. Uh, I'd say early learning is, is a space we're eager to, to put money to work, but it's a trickier category for a variety of reasons I'll get into. 
Um, and then the post-secondary space, I mean, we have a few just iconic companies growing in that category, Noodle being a really fun one. Um, but for a variety of reasons, I, I think the bulk of the innovation that we've been attracted to has been in the K-12 and, and then the, the career mobility sector. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about EdTech is that there's no, you know, no, no geographical hub. Um, you know, you think of Silicon Valley as being such a hot spot for startups. It's where our fund is based, it's where I live. Um, but the EdTech category, broadly speaking, has not, you know, coalesced around the, the San Francisco Bay Area or New York or Boston or some of these traditional hubs. And I think the reason for that has been, it's just been, up until call it 2014, 2015, almost impossible for ed tech companies to raise traditional venture capital. And you know the type of talent that these companies were tapping into to build their businesses weren't necessarily sort of like tech ecosystem centric. So a lot of the big ed tech companies that you see today are not based in those hubs. So we've been forced to as a firm, as we're pursuing this strategy to be really geography agnostic from the get go. Um, and so now that EdTech is receiving a lot of, of venture capital, what we're seeing are these really interesting businesses popping up um, all over the world, frankly. There's no sort of uh, domestic grip on the IP associated with building great EdTech businesses. So as an investor in the category, we, we really need to be geography blind. And that means that we need to understand you know, the consumer dynamics in, in other regions, the institutional dynamics in other regions, um, and it's forced us as a firm to be pretty globally minded from the get-go. And um, I, I'd say over the last, you know, really 24 months, uh, and, and going back further, of course, but really over the last 24 months, we've just seen an explosion in really super interesting innovations and entrepreneurship happening overseas. So, yeah, we've been lucky enough to support a lot of that. <laughs> That's amazing. I know you said you've been doing a lot in the K-12 space, and I think everything that happened throughout covid I don't think we would have ever thought of it previously this way, but parents have been using K through 12 almost as childcare where other markets take like Asia, see K through 12 as an opportunity for their kids to get ahead. Um, how are you seeing the ed tech development or advancements in those countries treat K through 12 potentially as this opportunity to get ahead? Yeah, it's super interesting. I think, you know, some of the reasons for, for that is like, uh, you, you know, uh, there's just structural differences all around the world, no surprise, right? And so in, in places like China and India, you have enormously high stakes testing environment. Uh, you think the SAT is high stakes over here? Like, uh, you know, the, the, the Gaokao in China and the tests they take in other, other regions of the world, like you perform well on that test, your family is in a different economic position for generations, literally. Like it's a very high stakes um, set of circumstances. So as a result of that, you have just this different, you know, family consumer mindset around around spending on education. So, um, you know, what has emerged, uh, you know, the, some big businesses were built in China, but we're seeing the same phenomenon in, 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 in other regions, enormous direct to consumer spending on education. So, you know, if, if the school system that you're a part of isn't, you know, meeting your academic objectives, or you don't feel like you're, it's going to get it done for you to perform well in that environment, you see, again, a lot of families spending on education. That's built enormous education companies. Um, and so, you know, I think the same phenomenon is starting to emerge here in the United States. Certainly with the pandemic, we're seeing a big uptick in direct-to-consumer opportunity uh, for, you know, for entrepreneurs who are trying to build products to, to serve families directly. Um, so as anyhow, as we think about making investments around the world, obviously these kind of, these like, vastly different consumer behavior dynamics in different regions come into play. You know, uh, Tori, Alex and I were talking about this the other day in terms of uh, private equity's really entrance into this space. And you, you talked about this, you know, a number of years ago, if you were an ed tech company, you, you, you couldn't get funded in the U.S. Obviously, that's changed with you uh, uh, and OWL's um, uh, infusion of cash into the space. But I know there are other PE firms as well. Uh, I guess the point is, is COVID has, I guess, put the incentive out there for the innovators to come to the space now, it seems like across the yeah. globe, right? And I guess I'm just wondering what you're noticing now that there is this heightened attention uh, and uh, energy coming from private equity firms like your, yourself into the space. How's that changing? Because historically, 
there just hasn't been a ton of that. I mean, most of education has been uh, a lot of state run things that have long standing infrastructures. I guess, uh, how are you noticing these two things now intersecting in a way that they really probably haven't done? <laughs> well, it, it's amazing, right? And, and I'll, I'll comment on it from sort of the bottoms up, the point of view of the entrepreneur, as well as the institution top down. But um, you're right. I mean, we have one, let's talk about K-12 first. We have 1.8 billion learners around the world pushed into distance learning, right? So uh, all, all of us uh, engaged parents, I happen to be one, right? Like I, I sort of thought I knew what was going on in school historically. Like I stay pretty close to my kids. I know all their teachers. But, you know, when, when the, the content in the curriculum is in your living room and you're overseeing that directly, I mean, you're just, you're, you're massively closer to it than you ever were before, no matter how involved you thought you were. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that a lot of um, frustration has emerged, uh, a lot of surprise about what students were learning, a lot of uh, direct observation of how, you know, folks, uh, students in their homes were engaging with the curriculum, engaging with the content, uh, and a lot of points of view emerged. And, and I think what, what I'd say is that that's created a absolute explosion in entrepreneurship. So uh, a lot of these families were had a lot of uh, great entrepreneurs in the building. And, and so what we're seeing is, is an enormous explosion of companies stepping in to address some of these issues, right? So for an early stage investor, there's never been a better time to, to be interacting with entrepreneurs and, and getting to you know, support and uh, get behind some of these amazing ideas that are emerging from all that activity. Um, then on the other end of the spectrum, the, the, from the point of view of uh, like higher ed institutions, enterprises, companies that are looking to employ folks. I mean, just the shift in understanding about what's now possible. Like, for example, this interview, I would imagine in times past, I would come see you in your office and we would sit down in a studio. Uh, I mean, this whole modality shift is having big time ripple effects in terms of, of massively broadening the scope of how companies think about who's a prospect uh, that they can, they can reasonably onboard and hire. And what that is doing, in my humble opinion, you play that out, uh, you know, a ways the, the opportunity set for people that otherwise wouldn't have found their way to those positions is now very realistic. Um, you know, the, the number of companies, especially Silicon Valley companies that are now like, you know, migrating to this sort of uh, distance modality in perpetuity. Again, the, the notion of how do we identify talent? How do we understand what skills are necessary to be successful in this environment? How do we manage and onboard all that talent as they migrate their way into, into the enterprise? Um, all that is being rethought in real time, again, creating this explosion of opportunity for you know, entrepreneurs. And so again, I, you know, like this seems sort of like, boy, you could spin this two ways. Is this a horrible thing? Is this a wonderful thing? I, I, I choose to take a really optimistic point of view. You know, the, 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 the amount of, you know, data fidelity, innovation, um, I, I think personalization that's now possible in K-12, especially as we play out all these opportunities, is, is really in a, a really exciting uptick. Um, and then as we think about just what, what the enterprise space looks like long term, I, I, we're in this kind of scary moment of disruption, but I think where we end up is just a much more inclusive work environment that's much more focused on tactical skills as opposed to you know, what we might have valued more yesterday, which would have been sort of resume or pedigree or something of that nature. So I, I, I think this is, these are long-term, really world-positive shifts. Yeah, I, um, and you're kind of hitting on it, right, where it's it also feels like a moment of liberation, uh, meaning like generally, uh, because everybody's getting used to this modality, the best instruction in the world will now, shouldn't be, I, I, at least I wouldn't think, be held captive to certain geographies or certain audience um, I think uh, the evolutions that you're talking about hopefully are going to lead to um, more quality of opportunity and access and, and, and quality as well. Um, well, for sure. I, I mean, and you think like, you know, what are the basic elements of an education? It's fun to think about this in terms of K-12 where it's, you know, pretty straightforward. We all have a lot of familiarity. So, you know, there's great content, whether that's coming out of a, a world-class teacher's mouth or coming over a video screen or being presented to you out of a book or some other modality. Um, there's the sort of like uh, student side of it, the grit, the engagement, the, it, the sort of like, what do I want to do with my life? How do I get from here to there? And, and then, and then I think there's this magic spark, which is, um, you know, this third element, which is this motivation, this, this like, 
you know, what a world-class teacher puts in a student's mind to get them to jump out of bed in the morning and want to, like, engage in this content and build a different sort of vision uh, for the future, right? Um, I, you know, the content side, like, let's just call that a very solvable problem, not without its challenges and subsequently huge opportunities. But like, like you said, John, I think like, you know, world-class teachers are now going to be able to beam themselves into every living room or classroom in the world. And I think that the, the cost of doing that and accessing that content is going to, you know, rapidly go to zero. So that'll be very cost-effective. Um, you know, the... The sort of uh, the student side of it and the, 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 the sort of third element that I'm having a tough time articulate, the magic that a, a great teacher puts. I mean, if all of us were to pause and say, hey, who's the one or two teachers in your life that changed your directory, helped you find your way to Google, or in my case, being an investor or whatever, like we could rattle those names off quickly. And that's, I think, you know, that's not going to be, that's not a trivial problem to solve in this new world that we're entering into, right? So like, Making sure that products are engaging, you know, we got a lot of great companies doing a really good job of that. Making sure world-class instructors are getting identified and recorded and being, we're doing a world-class job of that. This sort of teacher-student relationship element, I, I mean, that, I, I can't stress enough, like, we cannot forget that, right? And, um, and nobody is, right? I mean, everyone's, like, keen into the fact that, like, you know, that, that missing element must be present in a world-class education. And, and again, I just, I chalk that up to what a fabulous opportunity for a whole world full of amazing entrepreneurs to try to figure out how to solve. And, and we're looking hard for companies that are addressing that element. I think one of the recent hot topics in K through 12, back when class still took place in the building consistently was social emotional learning. I'm yeah. curious how you're seeing that um, be advanced through ed tech, but also balance with digital advancements. So how are we solving for something that we, it was hard to solve for in person in the classroom now in a virtual environment? Yeah, and I, like, listen, like, I, I think the, the severity of the problem and need and uh, has never been greater, right? Uh, that, that's well documented. You know, I won't plug companies, of course, but we do have a company called Panorama based out of Boston that's doing a fabulous job, you know, ad ad addressing and tracking and managing a lot of those, a lot of those dynamics. Um, so, I, again, I, it, let's just call it an unsolved problem for sure. Um, I, I think that, like, you know, we're all different and we're all different learners and we all experience school differently. I mean, there's plenty of families that are coming forth saying, man, my student who was you know, not exactly thriving in the classroom, really took a passion for learning and distance, or, you know, I'd say those, those stories are much less uh, common than the ones where, you know, students really suffered um, in, in isolation. But I think what it's highlighting is that like, hey, if there's a spectrum of, of learning approach, there's a, spect a spectrum of like sort of, you know, behavioral wellness and, and health among students. Um, I don't think there's a silver bullet. What I'd say is that like the fact that we're all talking about this, the fact that, you know, entrepreneurs are now keenly aware of the, A, the magnitude of dollars that are available for solutions that address these problems effectively. Um, uh, the, the number of sort of like uh, notable folks, politicians, school leaders that are standing up and saying, hey, this is a national pandemic. We need solutions. Uh, you know, I happen to have a lot of faith in, in sort of the entrepreneurial ecosystem to, to rise to that challenge, but let's just say it's it's not solved by, by any stretch. Not solved, but uh, to your point, like uh, this data has, uh, data and insights have always existed on the higher ed side, whether we're talking about social, psychological, or we're talking about academic counseling, advising, yeah. making sure that we reduce attrition rates and speed, success, like that's always all been there. I do feel like this moment is now, to your point, whether it's politicians, education leaders, school presidents, um, administrators of all, all levels are now saying, we need the solutions. Maybe now we can start to build that bridge between what has always been there in terms of the insights, but that pair that with the technologies to actually un unleash them. I just don't know that we had the urgency before, right? Like, uh, yeah. As my, uh, as my father likes to remind me, people don't change in the midst of comfortable situations. <laughs> so true Edu education has been comfortable for a while but we're now all uncomfortable and i think that's maybe promoting a much healthier dialogue across the whole ecosystem well, uh, you know you can't ignore uh physical health you can't ignore mental health and like one of the big tragedies is this like the inequities associated with accessing solutions right and so you know, if you think about the school district as 
you know, a, a melting pot of society in, in, in many ways. And obviously, that's a gross generalization. M many school districts are in much different situations than others. But uh, it's a way to aggregate all of those families and all of those students. And, and we believe a, a phenomenal channel for delivering those services and solutions, right? So again, I'm slipping into plugging companies. We have a company called Hazel Health, which is, you know, that's a, uh, they deliver physical health uh, and healthcare to students in, via via schools, and they and they're now you know having a lot of success and, and interest in their mental health solutions as well. So like a, again, like what could be just sort of a tragic state of affairs, and oh my gosh, all these poor kids are going back to school, and they've had a year off, and all these sort of behavioral issues and mental health issues. You know, it's actually a great place to start addressing those via the school district, and. Um, you know, that, that takes a little creative thinking, that takes a, a restructuring of how we think about the sort of purpose and use of those institutions, but it's, an, it's a fabulous opportunity for folks who are, you know, preparing products and services and solutions that can work within the, you know, the confines of, 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 of those institutions. So I, I, again, I come back to like, these problems are well known, they're well documented, they're being discussed broadly. Thank, thankfully, they're not being pushed under the rug. And, and you know, again, I. I have faith that some great solutions are on the way. <laughs> so I've got, we've got no problems with the, uh, the company plugs. It's actually a good segue. <laughs> where, where, where Alex, I know, wants to go on uh, sort of the idea of awareness and branding, but that's what you're doing essentially is we're shedding light on uh, the fact that these, um, what well, A, the problems exist, which we've known, but there are actually companies and people like trying to focus on them, right? Um, but that, that's not, Tip, that's not where the history of education is. It hasn't been a spent a uh, ton of time spent on what I guess we would call in the media world where Alex and I live on branding um, or re really heightening awareness of, of some of these things. I, I know, Alex, this is a, a, an area you're passionate about and, and a line of question we wanted to get to with, uh, with Tori. Yeah, Tori, I'm so interested. I mean, knowing that the entire world, whether it's K through 12 or higher ed or adult learners, they all were thrust into digital learning for the first time in some format if they hadn't been yet in the last year or so. A lot of the companies that you're working with in your firm might have seen first-time customers. And I won't say, you know, we've seen the end of COVID yet. Maybe we're emerging or there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But how are you advising firms to balance near-term performance, but also awareness to try and keep these new customers while also gaining and meeting goals? Yeah, well, I love it. So, I, listen, I, I think we were on, I, again, I'll kind of focus my comments in the K-12 space because it's kind of the easiest one to, to grasp, but we can apply this to all other, other categories. So, like, I, I, I believe, you know, I think the data would support that we've been on a steady march, you know, of, of migration from analog to digital across course materials, assessment, um, and, and sort of, like, you know, the, the notion that technology was going to be further integrated into the classroom experience, whether that's in class, out of class, et cetera. Um, it, it, and so, the, you know, the adoption rates of these products and these solutions have, have been on a steady climb. With COVID, like if you didn't have the ability to reach your students digitally, you, you ran out and got those solutions quickly. I would sort of argue that you were going to be buying those solutions regardless um, sometime in the next three to five years. So we had a big pull forward of demand. So, you know, a, a, a fun company to talk about is, is Newzella, right? Like they're taking, um, you know, nonfiction content from, you know, hundreds of, of partners all over the world and re-leveling that content to make it accessible to students in classrooms. Uh, you know, th that's been a very fast growing company for a long time. Um, we saw, you know, big spikes in adoption of their products because they spoke, or not spoke, they worked so well in a distance modality and that's, you know, teachers could stay up to speed on, on uh, making sure that students were engaged in content. All of the analytics uh, were, were made available to teachers so that they could understand, okay, who's keeping up, who's not keeping up, how are we progressing as a class? Um, all, all of those tools are massively valuable even when you're all together. I, I would argue they're even more valuable when you're all together. So. While it was a, a, a helpful tool during distance modality, once you start engaging students in this way, it's a very, very you know tall order to to imagine teachers saying, "Oh wow, all this all this amazing student engagement we saw, all this uptick in interest in these learning standards as a result of this you know amazingly sort of relevant nonfiction content." 
you know, now that we're all together, yeah, we don't really need that anymore. Like, we're, we're just seeing none of that. It, you know, what, what I'd say is, is what we're seeing is this was a great way for a lot of products to get exposure because they were viewed as critical in this moment of distance modality need. But there, all those products were designed to serve students in a traditional modality. Those, those companies have been around for 10 years doing what they've been doing, and they've been honing their product and testing their product and improving their product in traditional classroom settings. And so, um, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, for, for those of us who are investors in the category, it's, yeah, it's fun to see this accelerated adoption, but, but all it is is a pull forward of organic growth that was happening anyhow. So I, I'd say what, we shouldn't fall in love with the growth rates that we saw with a lot of that pull forward demand, but, you know, I, we were pretty convinced uh, that, you know, these, these best in class products were, were going to be broadly adopted, you know, regardless. I, and I'll just say a few more points on that. Like, you know, the, the products that are winning and the products that, you know, this happens to sync with our own personal investment strategy. Others may have different approaches to this market, but we, we spend an enormous amount of time looking at student outcome data. That's, you know, love to hear from every, any entrepreneur in the world, but don't sit down with us without like concrete analytics on how you are accelerating the learning uh, of the students you're serving relative to incumbents and relative to competitors. Like we as a firm want to back the companies that are driving the most robust, like deepest learning, accelerated learning, efficient uh, learning in students. And I, I, that's a two-way street. That comes from world-class content that is focused on the learning standards that we're trying to, to try to impress on these students. And it comes from the students as well. And, and, and what I mean by that is if all this content has existed, we know what we need to teach. The, the issues we have is lack of engagement from students. So you know, take a, a, a company like Dreambox Learning, which does this, you know, I think as well as any company on planet Earth, they find a way to engage students. Students want to work with their product. Students wake up at 6 a.m. on a Saturday to log on to Dreambox and get, get back to work because it's fun, because it's, it, it's empowering, it's, in, it's enriching, and students feel that. If, you know. So I could go off on that for a long time, but like one, one of the fun examples we like to joke about is that like, you know, a lot of students have you know, attention disorders and behavior problems in school, and we say, oh gosh, we should treat this with medication or other things, and in certain, certain circumstances, that's of course warranted. But I think a lot of, a, a lot of that is like, these students just can't learn in the classroom. We're all frustrated and we're creating problems. Then that same student goes home and plays video games for 72 hours straight without blinking or going to the bathroom, right? Like obsessive engagement from the same students who can't sit still in a classroom. So like, it's, not, it's not a human biology problem. It's a lack of engagement or interest or whatever with the content. Now, be that the modality that it's being delivered or, or whatever. I mean, there's a hundred problems that could be wrong with that, but it's not that it's not, we can't blame students. They just don't have it or some nonsense like that. We need to take a look at the products, the services, the content we're putting in front of these students and make sure that we're catering to 2021 youth, not what I did in school or my parents did in school or whatever. It, the world's different. Can I tee you up for a content question? I'm curious how you're seeing uh, like the changing of the guard from their art traditional education publishers to potential new startups and what you think content in the classroom might look like. Yeah, I love it. I, and so like, I, I don't have like a clear vision of that, but what I would say is, um, you know, we, we've thought of video games and gaming and TV as like poison to learning, right? Like, students playing on this stuff or doing with it, you know, I don't pretend to know a lot about it, but it's like an the antithesis of like sitting down and reading a book and engaging. I think what we as folks who are trying to help learning happen, we should be taking lessons from, from these folks who are getting students' attention. So if you have a, I, I mean, instead of saying, oh God, I'm so frustrated that kid's staring at that iPad or playing the Nintendo or whatever they're doing, we should be saying, huh, that thing, Whatever bell it's ringing or light it's flashing, it's getting us yeah. to like obsessively focus on it. Let's let's take some of those cues and, and and adapt some of that to, you know, what we think is productive struggle learning environment type type of type of work. So, again, I don't think education is going to look like gaming. I'm not saying that, 
But what I am saying is that we need to find ways to find organic, natural ways that draw students into wanting to learn about the learning standard that they're being asked to learn. Like you ask, a, I, I, I'll think of a fun example. This, this is going to stress test some of your audience a little bit. You take a ninth grade bio student and you sit them down and say, hey, we're going to learn about photosynthesis today. I, I mean, unless you're like me who loves growing vegetables in your garden, like <laughs> your average 13-year-old, they don't care at all about learning that standard. They don't care. I, like whatever we may think and hope, they don't care. And so we need to find ways to say, hey, photosynthesis is actually something you should care about, by the way. Um, you know, there are indoor cannabis growers in Denver, Colorado. Guess how they get those plants to grow? Photosynthesis. You may be a surfer in San Diego. You know that algae bloom that shut down trestles for two months last summer? That's photosynthesis. You know, like, you, you got to find ways to reach these students and say, hey, you actually do care about this learning standard, and let me find a contextual reason for you to engage. Um, again, I'm coming back. That's, that's, that's why Uzella exists. That's what their product does. But, you know, apply that thinking to every category. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I think it's such a good point. You're, you're, uh, that really hits home in terms of, like, it's just about the engagement, uh, I guess, modality or environment um, that we deploy. And maybe tech is going to help us there. I guess I'm going to keep it there for a second. Talk to us a little bit about mobile in terms of, I guess, either how your uh, investment companies are thinking about it, how you're seeing that evolve maybe what we can learn globally versus domestically. Again, sometimes infrastructure helps um, advancement. Sometimes it actually um, keeps it from maybe going as fast as we would like. And I wonder how you're seeing that uh, across different parts of the globe as it relates to mobile and its impact. Well, th well two fun examples. Um, <clears throat> one is Quizlet, right? Like everyone knows Quizlet, right? You know, rapidly approaching 100 million users. Um, one of the, uh, we think the, the most scaled learning platforms in the world. Uh, vast, vast, vast majority of interaction with that product is via mobile, right? So I think what that says is students have access to mobile devices, whether we think it or not, they do. And, um, you know, the, this notion of like, I, I'll use a term I hate, but like snackable learning, right? Like the ability to, you know, I'm sitting here, I've got 20 minutes before my practice starts or I'm in the car with my mom or dad or whatever. Like, I, I think that like finding ways to reach students in really convenient, you know, on the go type, you know, mobile modality ways is, is 100% critical. Like if you, if, if a company is not designing their product to be mobile friendly, I really think, I mean, A, you're gonna have a heck of a time raising money and B, like, I just, I just don't think you're meeting students where they are. So I, I'd say the vast majority of the products that that entrepreneurs are, are launching today are, are, if not mobile first, very mobile friendly. Um, so I, I just, that's just kind of a domestic point of view on like what's happening in the US and obviously we love all, all the companies that are popping up on mobile. Uh, in other geographies, it's, it's do or die, right? So like if you are not mobile first in, for example, uh, Central or South America, you don't exist. If you are not, you know, we just backed a company in Nigeria called ULesson which is, you know, delivering supplemental learning solutions to students via mobile. The, the, the hope of, of reaching students all across Africa in, in a broadband only desktop modality is not, that's, that's not a fundable strategy, right? So um, I think like, you know, I'm talking to you on my desktop computer at, in my house. I, I would imagine, I'll just make a crazy statement, in 10 or 15 years time, these things won't exist. I mean, all, all of this like work product that we're so used to, all, all of that will, it, I may be looking on a screen this size, but it'll probably be a processor in my phone. So I just think that like, it's clearly the future, the notion that, uh, and, and especially for youth, right? So um, yeah, I, I can't under, <laughs> I can't overstate the importance of being kind of mobile friendly on products. I, taking this one more step further, I, I, I do think we're gonna see some mega, like global education brands emerge. So like think Disney, think Lego, kind of global appeal. And those will be mobile first companies with uh, like, there's just no two ways about it. it, it, it to, to reach users in all these different places, you're gonna have to do that. And you think about the, the cost of, yeah, I don't wanna pick on a particular company, the, the cost of distributing Disney things around the world or the cost of getting Legos to, 
you know, emerging markets or, or, or whatever, like all of that goes to zero in, in the education market. Like it's just data. And, and so there's going to be expensive ways to interact with the data. So think of, you know, like if, if we wanted to get an MIT caliber engineering education today, you, or, or pick your elite university, all that content is for free online. Like you can just go yep. learn all that. Now, if you're a normal student like me, you're going to need a little help getting your, yourself there. So, you know, you might hire tutors or, or engage in traditional schooling or whatever you're going to do to help scaffold and march yourself and provide that sort of, in, sort of like, uh, motivational spark to get to the goal line. But if you just want the information, like it's all out there and it's all free. So you, I think the, the, the big win companies, the, the, the Lego of education, the, the Disney of education, these are going to be companies that make all of that content totally world-class, totally free, and then sell services to help students, you know, march through that learning and and reflect their learning, turn that learning into currency that it, it leads to employment in the global economy. Like that's the future, and and no one's really put all those pieces together yet. Um, but I, I mean, that's a, the trillion dollar market cap company is coming, and that, and that's what it's going to be. I think one further wrinkle of complexity, keeping you on this access topic a little bit longer. I know in the past you've said. By 2025, I think one in four students will be English as a second language students. What sort of solutions are you starting to see address students and like meeting them where they are or even helping parents that might not be English first in guiding their students through an education? You know, I, it, this is one of the biggest puzzles of, of my investing career. The demographic trends are crystal clear. Uh, if we look at the ratio of children being born in Africa and play that out to 2030 to 2050, like, uh, you know, I'm going to get the stat wrong, but it's like directionally like 50% of all children born in the world will be in Africa in the coming decades, right? We're not seeing any products. I mean, U-Lesson is one that I've supported in Africa, but like there's not enough responsiveness to these obvious demographic shifts. So ELL, English Language Learners, this, this is one we've talked about since we started our fund. If I go back to my fund one fundraising deck, it was like this demographic shift is underway. There's going to be massive businesses popping up to go address that challenge. <laughs> Entrepreneurs out there, hello, like we're, we're, we're not seeing them. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a, a fabulous entrepreneur in Boston named Jordan Moranis who has an amazing company called Elevation Learning that, that's doing great work on the ELL side, but we're not seeing the explosion of products that, you know, the, the, there, there's procurement dollars for these ser products and services. We're not seeing it um, emerge fast enough. And so it's one of these things where like we as a fund get to have this beautiful lens on what's happening. We think we got a good pulse on all the entrepreneurial interesting things bubbling up all over the world. But we also see these obvious like, guys, go build here. Like th th there's dollars here. Like there's, there's need here. Um, and so that's just one of these frustrations we live with. I, I, I think we see the demand, but we're not seeing the supply. Uh, that part's interesting. Now, demographic shifts are something that we talk a lot about, uh, even domestically, let alone what you're alluding to globally. And I, I think you're right. There, there is a delayed reaction to a factual trend that is obvious and needs to be um, needs to be addressed and embraced. Uh, and I think we've gone a long way in that regard. I, as I predicted, this conversation is speeding along, but I do want to, and I know most of your focus is on K-12, but I'd be remiss to to get your take on higher ed and how that's evolving. One of the things that we do focus on as a team is where student mindset has been and it's mirroring what you're saying in terms of K-12. Before COVID, you know, there were about 30% of, of higher ed students that were enrolled in some form of online education, whether it was pure play or hybrid. On the back end of this, 80% of those same students are now expecting um, some form of, of online tech and embracing this. Tori, I think you and I had this conversation. I talked to a, a regional university president who surveyed his students the other day and said, ask them all, hey, how do you like our flex technology, which is essentially letting them zoom into classes and you know, gave them a, a scale of zero to 10. And they all said, eh, it's about a four, right? Not, not real good. The follow-up question was like, well, would you rather, would you like to have us take it away? Uh, or should we keep it? And the answer was no, 10. We want to keep it. <laughs> they, they've already built in the fact we'll get better, but I do like the, the flexibility it's giving me 
whether it's you know taking care of children, parents, travel, uh, taking out another job. I guess I'm curious uh, just to get your take on how do you see that space evolving now? Um, and it probably is the most <clears throat> infrastructure we have, and it does seem like everything is shifting now. But from your entrepreneurial lens, I'm, I'm curious to see how you see this evolving. Well, those students can rest easy because we've backed a company called Class Technologies, which is going to, you know, make that that uh, modality a lot more engaging. But uh, you know, all, all joking aside, um, it, it, it's going to get better, and it's going to get better in a hurry. Um, so I, again, when you see that, under no circumstance can you take this away or you know limit the flexibility that I've been enjoying. I mean, I, we're seeing that in the corporate world. Obviously, higher ed is going to have to adapt super quick to that, and I, you, you know. Uh, we're investors in a company called Noodle, which is an online program uh, ma management platform. So, like helping universities launch these web-based degree programs. And you know, with COVID, we just an explosion in student demand. Not surprisingly, to pursue these 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 degrees virtually. Um, what we're seeing are the learning outcomes are similar, if not better. And you know, uh, uh, it, it, it are many elements missing as a result of this. Of course, the student-to-student -student network building, the friendships, the, all of the stuff that we look back on those experiences and love personally, that's certainly a big takeaway I had from those experiences. But, but in terms of like learning the stuff and being ready to roll, like this is better. And, and so I, that, that's a challenging concept, but the data is not, not ambiguous on that. So I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. And um, that, that sort of distance modality is, is gonna be in high demand. I mean, I think just stepping back for a second and looking at higher ed as a whole and the themes that we're keyed into, I mean, higher ed is, let's just start, let's start at the top, very expensive. And student debt is, I mean, ask a politician in Washington, what are the three biggest problems in America? Like student debt is probably making most folks list. You look at sort of the mental health, all of the, you know, life outcome, well-being of folks who carry a lot of debt. And most of that debt they're carrying is student debt and it's impaired relative to folks who are not. So it's a, it's a crisis that we as a society need to address. And, you know, one of the solutions, obviously, <laughs> on a go forward basis, forget the problem that we're holding right now, but is for institutions to adapt and offer much more low cost, flexible learning. And again, you look at some of the innovation that like a place like Arizona State is doing where they're saying, you know, if, uh, you know, I'm going to get these numbers directionally, right, but call it like rough math, almost 200,000 enrolled students. This is, this is massive, right? And I think they're proving that they can do that effectively and well and meet students' needs. So you take that, you apply that to an elite university, an Ivy League school or an elite school on the West Coast that, that lets in, I don't know, 800 freshmen a year. And you sort of say to yourself, well, it, I can certainly educate 801 i can probably educate 900 well why not 9 million and once you get really good at distance modality i mean like listen if you look at the top 20 universities the dam is going to break one of those institutions is going to say hey you know what like we're, we're in a position of power instead of like putting up walls and creating our brand as a as, as a byproduct of our exclusivity Let's just flip that totally upside down and be anti-exclusive as an institution and just focus on elite education, but eliminate the notion of exclusivity from their mandate. That's going to happen. I, I mean, I bet, my, I bet my whole firm that that's going to happen in, a short, in short order here. And so the, the, the upside for you know, one of those institutions saying, okay, we are now the institution that educates the world under our brand and we sell products and services to help students be successful on those curriculum journeys, whatever they happen to be studying. Uh, again, you, you build one of the most powerful institutions, be it for-profit, not-for-profit, whatever th this planet has ever encountered. And so why would you not do that? Like, I, 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 it, it's on the right side of history. It's where the world is going. Someone's going to break. And once one does it, they all have to do it. And so that is an absolutely spectacularly cool thing for, you know, those of us who are lucky enough to be alive at this moment in time. Like we're, we're quickly approaching like the, the, this shift in mentality where content is free. 
So again, like I, I mentioned earlier, you want to go get an MIT level engineering education? You just do that online right now. Um, you want to have the degree to turn that into currency to go get yourself that job? Well, you know, that's not solved yet, but I think that's coming too. And so this is the first time in human history that I, I mean, someone can correct me if I'm wrong on this, where we're, we're, in our lifetime, we're going to see elite education cost zero. And that's, that's, that's like a sea change shift in who we are as human beings on this planet. Like, forget Americans in interacting with jobs. Like, you, you get born anywhere in the world and you decide you want to be an expert at anything. You, you, you might not be able to pay all the supports and services to help you kind of shuffle you along like, like those of us uh, have had over the years. You're not going to have that, but you're going to have access to all the content and subsequently all the information to pursue that ambition. That's going to happen in our lifetime. And that's a, I mean, dude, that, that, that changes everything. And, um, I, you know, so anyhow, we're, we're, we're passionate about funding that shift in the world. I think it's probably the biggest economic opportunity in the history of capitalism. So, you know, never mind all the good, it's, it's going to flow from that. This is, this is, a, this is a big opportunity. So I think, Alex, we can put uh, Tori right with Brandon Bustida, Kaplan, and, Fields, and uh, Professor yeah. Calloway of saying that we're going to see major institutions go to a million plus students. And I, I absolutely agree with you, Tori. And I think it's a huge opportunity to the benefit of students and, and really the world. Um, I think that's, that's certainly an exciting time. I guess this will be my last question. I'll leave it to Alex to kind of um, ask her last question, maybe bring us to a close. But it sounds like you also think it's the time for I guess, employer and higher ed to kind of come together to speed better, better outcomes, right? I think when all, at least I'll speak for myself. When I went to college, I picked a school and I kind of just put my trust in, like, I'm going to get that degree and then hopefully it'll lead to a job. I feel like we're now at a place where there should be a much cleaner line of sight to that investment and the likely outcomes on the other side. And that bridge is formed with Essentially, employers helping to co-create curriculum in a much more intentional way. Yeah, with higher ed. You know, I've been shocked that those bridges or partnerships or alliances or or, or whatever they need, whatever form they need to take, have not happened faster. Right? You know, you look at um, let, let's say the top hundred higher ed institutions. Right? Like all of them have perhaps a unique point of view on the type of student they create, character, con let, all, all of that matters tremendously, right? Let, let, I'll, I'll just say this. We don't want every human being on earth learning from one curriculum, learning one thing, the exact same content, so that we're all just like, you know, there's no diversity in thought or approach. Or, so like, let's make sure we don't end up there. But what I would say is, you know, there's, what, 4,500 not-for-profit higher ed institutions in the United States. Do there need to be 4,500 different approaches to this problem? Uh, you know, maybe not. Um, and so what I think is, is a lot of those institutions should get very serious about specialization. So, you know, if you're an institution that's based in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, maybe you should become the world's elite institution for educating people around becoming expert in the insurance industry, where you, there's a big regional hub and a lot of demand for expertise there. Uh, you know, apply that same sort of uh, terrible analogy to all, all sorts of different universities that I think could become expert at certain things and align tighter with industry and subsequently, huh, I mean, talk about delivering better sort of life outcomes or career prospects and opportunities for the students. I think it would be, you know, a, a, a meaningful step forward for the, you know, the employability of those students. That being said, like, I, I don't pretend to have the, the right answer on solving this problem. I think it is a big problem. Um, higher ed needs to become massively less expensive, massively less exclusive, and much more in sync with the desires of their students. So I think there is, you know, maybe 100 years ago this was different, maybe 30 years ago this was different, but I think where we're at today, most students when they go to college are looking to advance their life prospects through the attainment of an elite education it will translate into a lot of career opportunity that allows people to pursue whatever they're into. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that career opportunity component is as tightly understood um, 
by the by these institutions. I, like it's a big problem. I think people inside of higher ed understand it's a big problem, but but it's not. We're not adapting quickly enough. Um, not, I will say this for the first time. I, um, to your point, not moving quickly enough, but there are some that totally see what you're saying and are embracing the offer for the moment. So we'll see how that evolves, but um, signs of encouragement for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't want this to influence your answer to the next question, but we like to end each of our segments um, with sort of an award show of what we call the head of the class. So passing the mic to you to highlight someone to our audience as someone to watch, someone that's making big waves in the education space or making impressive progress against a tough education challenge. Oh, man. I, I, I... Boy, I'm invested in 55 companies. Like, are there so many like just incredible people who are throwing their their you know their life into these problems for students? The the one I'm going to highlight though is Jesse Woolley Wilson, the CEO of Dreambox. She's um, uh, a dear let's start off with a dear friend of mine, of course, but um, just an absolute superstar when it comes to advocating for student outcomes. You know, she's, she's running a fabulously successful company with Dreambox and that product does amazing things. But when it comes to like keeping the boardroom discussion focused on student interest and student need and student outcome, um, I, you know, I, I'll just say it's refreshing to work with folks who like have that North Star every moment of every day, their whole life. And, and so anyhow, if, if anyone out there is ever lucky enough to have a conversation with Jesse, they'll, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about in the first five minutes. <clears throat> and anything we collectively can do to advance, you know, the, the ambitions of folks like that who are like really moving the needle on student outcomes at scale, that, that's where, you know, we as investors or, or anyone who has a megaphone to advance, uh, you know, entrepreneurs in this category need to be focused. And so anyway, she's a fun one to talk about. No, I love that. I can't wait to look into Dreambox more. You know, I know we asked you earlier about um, short-term goals and awareness, but flipping that equation to just putting student outcomes as the number one metric that you are just hard and fast focused on, I think is so important. And you're in good company with anyone that is doing that. So I can't wait <laughs> well, to learn more about that. Guess what? If your product really gets that right and really advances learning way better and way cheaper and way more efficient, you have phenomenal renewal rates you have very stable ARR dynamics, like all, yeah. all of these things that every entrepreneur is trying to like, you know, hack their way into. Guess what? If you drive learning better than any other product in your category, all that takes care of itself. So, you know, again, well done for you. <laughs> nice alignment here. Yes. Well, thank you for joining us. It has been a pleasure to swap ideas and learn about all of the latest. I loved all of the companies you've mentioned. We'll be sure to link for more information below in the description. And to our audience, thank you for watching again. Please be sure to like and subscribe, and we hope to see you on a future episode. Thanks again, Tori. Thanks for having me. Honored to be here. Uh, always fascinating to have you on. Really appreciate it.